All right. Looks like it's time to get started. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let's do this.
fortress into having faith, to endure all the trials and temptations that we have. He says that I am trustworthy. I will lead you into all my promises. Here we go. Still makes them broken whole I believe that the curse of sin was broken When they rolled away that snow I believe, I believe, I believe As I bow before you, Lord I will rise in confidence I will see your goodness, Lord The land I'm living
Holy 
name. Amen. The Book of the Revelation of Jesus. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the Gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a Messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalupsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament. And John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus, exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After this, John has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, and he describes it with imagery drawn from many Old Testament prophets. Surrounding God are creatures and elders that represent all creation and human nations, and they're giving honor and allegiance to the one true creator God who is holy, holy, holy. In God's hand is a scroll that's closed up with seven wax seals. It symbolizes the message of the Old Testament prophets and the sealed scroll of Daniel's visions. These are all about how God's kingdom will come here fully on earth as in heaven. But it turns out no one is able to open the scroll until John hears of someone who can. It's the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. He can open it. These are classic Old Testament descriptions of the messianic king who would bring God's kingdom through military conquest. Now, that's what John hears. 
But then what he turns and sees is not an aggressive Lion King, but a sacrificed bloody lamb who's alive, standing there, and ready to open the scroll. Now, this symbol of Jesus as the slain lamb, this is crucially important for understanding the book. John's saying that the Old Testament promise of God's future victorious kingdom was inaugurated through the crucified Messiah. Jesus overcame his enemies by dying for them as the true Passover lamb so that they could be redeemed. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was his enthronement. It was the way he conquered evil. And so this vision concludes with the lamb alongside the one sitting on the throne and together they are worshipped as the one true creator and redeemer and the slain lamb begins to open the scroll. It's a symbol of his divine authority to guide history to its conclusion. Which brings us to the next section of the book, the three cycles of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each cycle depicts God's kingdom and justice coming here on earth as in heaven. Now, some people think that the three sets of seven divine judgments represent a literal linear sequence of events that either happened in the past or could be happening now or are yet to happen in the future when Jesus returns. But notice how John has woven all the sevens together. So the final seven bowls come out of the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal. And the seven trumpets emerge from the seventh seal. They're like nesting dolls. Each seventh contains the next seven. Also notice how each of the series of seven culminates in the final judgment and they have matching conclusions. So it's more likely that John is using each set of seven to depict the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and future return from three different perspectives. So the slain lamb begins to open the scroll's first four seals. And John sees four horsemen. It's an image from the book of Zechariah chapter 1. And they symbolize times of war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. Then the fifth seal depicts the murdered Christian martyrs before God's heavenly throne. And the cry of their innocent blood rises up before God like smoke from the altar of incense. And they're told to rest because more Christians are yet to die. We're not told why, but we are told that it won't last forever the sixth seal is God's ultimate response to their cry. He brings the great day of the Lord that was described in Isaiah and Joel. And the people of the earth cry out, who is able to stand? And then all of a sudden, John pauses the action with an intermission to answer that question. John sees an angel with a signet ring coming to place a mark of protection on God's servants who are enduring all this hardship. And he hears the number of those who are sealed, 144,000. It's a military census, like the one in the book of Numbers, chapter 1. There are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, pay attention. The number of this army is what John heard, just like he heard about the conquering lion of Judah. But in both cases, what he then turned and saw was the surprising fulfillment of those military images in Jesus, the slain lamb. So when he sees this messianic army of God's kingdom, it's made up of people from all nations, fulfilling God's ancient promise to Abraham. It's this multi-ethnic army of the lamb who can stand before God because they've been redeemed by the lamb's blood. And now they are called to conquer, not by killing their enemies, but by suffering and bearing witness just like the lamb. After this, the seventh and final seal is broken. But before the scroll is opened, the seven warning trumpets emerge and fire is taken from the incense altar. It symbolizes the cry of the martyrs and it's cast onto the earth, bringing the day of the Lord to its completion. Now, with the seven trumpets, John backs up and he retells the story again, this time with images from the Exodus story. So the first five trumpet blasts replay the plague sent upon Egypt, and then the sixth trumpet releases the four horsemen that came from the first four seals. But then John tells us that despite all these plagues, the nations did not repent, just like Pharaoh didn't in the Exodus story. So it seems that God's judgment alone will not bring people to humble repentance before him. Then John pauses the action again with another intermission. An angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the lamb scroll is open and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. The scroll's content is spelled out in two symbolic visions. First, John sees God's temple and the martyrs by the altar, and he's told to measure and set them apart. It's an image of protection taken from Zechariah chapter 2. 
But then the outer courts in the city are excluded and they get trampled down by the nations. Now some think that this refers literally to a destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the past or will happen in the future. But more likely, John's following the tradition of Jesus and the apostles who all used the new temple as a symbol for God's new covenant people. In that case, this is an image about how Jesus' followers may suffer persecution by the nations, but this external defeat cannot take away their victory through the Lamb. This idea gets expanded in the scroll's second vision. God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. And once again, some people think this refers literally to two prophets who will appear one day in the future. But John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers, who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah and call idolatrous nations and rulers to turn back to the one true God. But then, all of a sudden, a horrible beast appears. Let the reader remember Daniel chapter 7. And the beast conquers the witnesses and kills them. But then, God brings them back to life and vindicates the witnesses before their persecutors. And the end result is that many among the nations finally do repent and give glory to the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Now, stop. Think about the story so far. God's warning judgments through the seals and through the trumpets did not generate repentance among the nations, just like the Exodus plagues only hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the lamb, he conquered his enemies by loving them, dying for them. And now the message of the lamb's scroll reveals the mission of his army, the church. God's kingdom will be revealed when the nations see the church imitating the loving sacrifice of the Lamb, not killing their enemies, but dying for them. It is God's mercy shown through Jesus' followers that will bring the nations to repentance. And this surprising claim is the message of the open scroll that John has placed at the exact center of the entire book. After this, the last trumpet sounds and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to the nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation. So just backing up before we get to our text today, if we go back to 17, chapter 17, we remember that we looked at the great prostitute, which we saw that that is ultimately the false church that is there. You have the loyal um, or bride of Christ, which we even saw last week. We'll end up seeing a little bit this week as well. Um, But... uh, That's in opposition to the prostitute. Then we had in chapter 18, the fall of the great Babylon. Then we have in chapter 19, the two feasts that are highlighted. You have the one that is the wedding feast or the wedding ceremony, the wedding feast, the wedding supper uh, of the lamb, which is a blessed feast. And then on the other side, you have, uh, it says the supper of God, which actually is um, a cursed place to be. That's where all the dead bodies end up being food for the birds of the air. Um, definitely a place we do not want to be. And then in chapter 20, we saw last week the defeat of Satan. The two feasts actually also highlighted the fall of the beast and also the false prophet, which came from Satan. And last week we saw in chapter 20 that Satan also ends up the same place that they do. It was just that chapter backing up and focusing specifically on Satan, but it's the same overall story. And that's really what Revelation gives us, is a lot of different ways, of different perspectives of seeing the same thing that's happening over and over and over again, much like the four Gospels that we have um, for Jesus, looking at Jesus and who he is. And this also is a revelation. And it's showing us not only what's happening at the end of time, um, but different ways of looking at it, different perspectives of seeing the many different elements that are all happening simultaneously. So here we are. We're in chapter 21. This is the second to last chapter. Next week will be our final week uh, in the book of Revelation. So now we're going to look at the new Jerusalem. And Jerusalem itself means foundation of peace or teaching peace. 
very important because that is where God is taking us. And we're going to look at this again, but the Sabbath itself was something that uh, a time of rest, a day of rest. Jerusalem is something of rest and peace is very much similar uh, in the, the idea of them. God is taking us to a place of rest, a place of peace. And Jerusalem is a foundation of peace. The new Jerusalem will actually be that in its fullness and fulfill the promise that God is taking us to the very place where he dwells, where his temple is in Jerusalem. So remember that this text that we've been looking at is symbolic. It is not literal. And so many people over time have looked at this book of Revelation as it being a literal thing. And it's not. That's not what apocalyptic literature and prophetic lip- literature is. It's very symbolic. So, And if we're going to see that, we have to carry that through the whole book, not just pick and choose parts that we want to be literal and then parts of it to be symbolic. So please keep that in mind as we look at the text also today. So this new Jerusalem, this new heavens, new earth, um, very much of that pulled out of the end of the book of Isaiah. Specifically, I'm going to read from Isaiah 65, verse 17 through 19. It says, Behold, I create new heavens and new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what, in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. This is something promised from the Old Testament. And we're going to see the fulfillment of it here in the New Testament. So... Here we go in the book of Revelation. So let's get started in our text. First slide, verse 1, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And that's important. It's from God. Um, Prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. So that's that verse three is actually a summary statement of really the entire chapter here. So that God is going to be with them, there's no separation, that God himself will be with them as their God. Very, very important for us to grasp that um, here in this first slide. So let's go through a few things. So first of all, heavens and earth. Isn't it interesting that that's used? First of all, heavens and earth. The heavens and the earth, remember in Genesis that you have three contexts that are highlighted in the creation story. You have the sea that's already there representing evil, chaos, wickedness. It's already there. However, we know that God is hovering over it. God is the creator of even that. So regardless, the sea is one element, and then you have the heavens and the earth that also are created. And then... um, the rest of, of the days show how God fills those contexts. So he highlights the context that they're there, and then he uh, fills them with living beings. So here, heaven and earth are two places that we see that there's a spiritual warfare. There also is a physical um, that's where humanity actually dwells, but there's also a spiritual mirroring that's happening. We see that also in chapter 12. What Jesus is doing on earth is mirrored by Michael um, in heaven as well. And it does highlight the spiritual warfare that is taking place. But either way, so heavens and earth, both of them, <clears throat> there's a new heaven, a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. The whole point of the sea, for those of you that like the sea and you're like, oh, new creation isn't going to have a sea. Remember, this is not literal. Okay, 
might there still be a C? I, I personally think that there will be, but I think creation is going to be very similar. New creation is going to be very similar to what we have right now. However, it is going to be without sin. It's going to be good. It's going to be without any evil. And C is something that where evil comes out of, where the dragon comes out of, where the beast comes out of. False prophet actually comes out of the earth, but regardless, still that is a place where evil often is. That's also where the Red Sea incident is, that God provides a way through the sea that comes against the seas on one side of Israel in the Exodus, and then you have um, Egypt that and Pharaoh coming up behind them, and God paves a way through the sea as he holds back Pharaoh with his presence. Um, Jesus walks on the sea. All of these things are showing that God's in charge, and the waves of the sea, the crashing of it against the boundaries that God put up for it, the sea, the sand on the on the shore. The waves crash against that. It's a symbol of rebellion. But either way, the sea is no more. The first heaven, the first earth passed away. They are gone. So God recreates something new. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven again from God. This is from God. And prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So therefore... This is something where, uh, this is an intimate relationship. This, this whole idea of marriage. New Jerusalem is, um, well, we're going to, it's the dwelling place where, uh, for the faithful remnant of Christ. And they're unified in this marriage. One, made one unified with no separation, no evil, no sea in the presence of either God or humanity. Awesome. So a couple of other things just to highlight here. First of all, the first was corrupted, the heavens and earth, it departed, went away. New creation is now established and a new one is eternal. The new one is something that God is doing through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. The sea no longer exists. Like we said, evil is gone. Satan is excluded from all of this. In Isaiah 51 verse 10 through 11, I'm going to quote this. This is These are things that highlight and give us hope for the future that the fulfillment is happening here in Revelation. So it says in Isaiah 51, verse 10 through 11, it says, Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion. Zion is another word for, it's bigger than Jerusalem, but it includes Jerusalem. With singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So again, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Isn't that interesting? You, the one who cut Rahab in pieces, which is another name for um uh, it can be a, a name for Rahab uh, or Egypt, but also as far as for uh, evil, the Satan who pierced the dragon. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deeps, talking about the exodus with um, at the Red Sea? Who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? Again, remembering the exodus. And again, here, same thing. Sea is gone. So, it fled completely. It's gone. So Isaiah 61 and 62, um, this is the very beginning of chapter 61. I'm not going to read the, both chapters, but I encourage you to do so because it does talk about this new creation. Here's, here's the beginning of it. A city not forsaken is what it's talking about. And Jesus actually uses this and quotes this at the beginning of his ministry. I think it's in the book of Luke. But he says, it says here from Isaiah chapter 61, it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that is where he stops, but it still goes on. And the day of vengeance of our God, which is happening here in the book of Revelation. Remember when Jesus says, I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the alpha and the omega. Jesus is the beginning of creation, meaning all life comes from him. He's been eternal. And so he's not, his end is not the end. He doesn't end, but he marks the end. So his not only um, the creation itself of all things starts with Jesus, but also new creation that he does through the Holy Spirit after his 
crucifixion and resurrection, there's a new covenant, a new um, creation that is done. Paul talks about this. The important thing is a new creation born by the Holy Spirit. John 3 talks about this um, with Nicodemus. So, this new creation that happens by Christ in the age of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we are right now. The whole, everything revolves around the Holy Spirit. And it's fascinating to me that so many churches avoid the Holy Spirit just because they don't want to sound Pentecostal or charismatic or whatever. They're afraid of tongues or whatever the case is. And that's, that's really unfortunate because this is the age of the Holy Spirit. This is what God has given to us. And the whole book, the whole Bible is about the presence of God. And we have access to his presence like never before. So anyways... The age of the Holy Spirit comes to its conclusion here. The day of vengeance of our God. And it marks the end of an age with sin and God mixed with his people. Sin is abolished. The end of the age comes with the judgment that when Christ comes again. And now there's a new existence, a new heaven, a new earth that starts. He's the beginning and the end. And he marks the beginning of a whole new age now also. Anyway, so continuing, to comfort all who mourn, grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, endurance, planting, the planting of the Lord, the seed, the tree, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise or raise up the former devastations, shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. God's going to fix things. And this is here, the culmination of it all. So let's keep going because we got quite a bit to cover here today. So slide number two, verse four, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall they be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. There is no sin. The ultimate fulfillment of peace and Sabbath is finally fulfilled. No death, no suffering. These are the former things and they have passed. They have themselves died. This is quoted from Isaiah 35.10 and 51.11. It's a further fulfillment of no sea being present in this creation. So, um, he says, As, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So, all things new... Um, The former things have passed away. It's an an existence now without sin. And so this trustworthy and true, what's fascinating also is that in chapter 19, verse 11, we see that Jesus, the one who is seated on the horse, is called faithful and true. Our text says trustworthy and true, but the trustworthy and faithful, it's the identical word. It's the same exact word. He is trustworthy and true. He is faithful and true. Same thing ultimately, the Hesed of God, the covenant faithfulness, uh, completely reliable. That is what he is. So, and he's saying here, I am, I've promised this and this has come. Awesome. All right, next slide. And verse six, and he said to me, it is done. And we should recognize that from John 9, I'm sorry, John 19, verse 30, when Jesus says it is finished when he's on the cross and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So that marks the beginning of an age with the age of the Holy Spirit. This millennium, what I argue last week, is starts here where Jesus says it is finished. And this age of the Holy Spirit now, this age of the new covenant, comes in to start. And here now, it says here the end of it. It is done. It is completed. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So all that I just covered before, Jesus is the one that marks the beginning and the end of something. Doesn't mean that he was born in the sense of that he was created and then he dies. No, he marks the beginning and the ends of different moments. Even in creation, you have day one and it was light. It was darkness. End of the first day. Second day then starts the beginning, the end. He is the Alpha, the Omega. 
to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. That is a huge concept of life giving. Um, the water of life that John uh, refers to in his gospel in chapter 4 with the woman at the well, verse 14, where he says, but whoever drinks of the, that of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So here it is, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And that's this is exactly it. Without any any kind of payment, there's no charge for it. It's it's it is surrender of a life to God, but there's no nothing that you have to pay to be able to get this. It's free. And the one who conquers will have this heritage. Will live in an existence with God without sin, without any pain or any more suffering. To the one who conquers, I will will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. And this is referring back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, I will be the father to him, meaning the descendants of David, and he will be my son. And we inherit that through Christ. So, and then continuing verse 8, but as for the cowardly, so this is the, this is the pivot here. So, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, now the cowardly, that means fearful. So those who were not able to endure through all the suffering that they had to go through for the testimony of Christ, those who were cowards, those who feared, who were filled with anxieties and fears and did not consider that the fear of God was more worthy than the fear of man or humanity. So the cowards, the faithless, or the unbelieving, those who would not believe or follow Christ, the detestable, those that are abhorrent, those that um, the things that God highlights as being detestable, unholy, those that participate in that, the murderers, those who kill, sexually immoral, so the prostitutes, the sorcerers, magicians, those who lean on... Um, Magic and witchcraft, um, idolaters, so anyone who creates idols, that is a huge thing for all, especially Americans, but all humans, because we are idol-making machines, uh, Calvin says. All who lie, all deceivers, what that means, all wicked, all those who bear fruit in the likeness of Satan will go to the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Remember, those that are gods will not suffer the second death. The second death, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that you're wiped out for existence. It means, because we are eternal beings, we will go on and live for eternity. Um, even though death has consumed our bodies, our spirits still go on. So after that, then we are arisen to a place of either eternal life, in God's presence, no sin, no more suffering, or... We go to eternal torment um, to basically pay for the for the um, for the sins against God, which Jesus takes upon Himself because He is a divine, eternal being. So He pays the price that we could never pay. But what happens is we start having to pay that price eternally. That's the wages of sin is death, and so therefore we go to pay the price of what it is that we. We refuse to let God pay for us. He offers, I will take that upon myself. You just follow me. And he's the one that made us to begin with. We were meant to follow him, to believe in him, to be unified to him. That's where happiness, love, life truly is. And yet, see how deep sin goes that, that we wouldn't even see the value of that. We'd take it more offensive that how dare you, God, how dare you impose yourself upon me and ruin my life, my kingdom. I'm king here. You're not king. Um, how dare you offend me like that? It just shows that we're enemies to God ultimately. And that is sin. That, that's, that's the heart of sin. All right. So let's keep going. The next slide. Slide number four. Verse nine. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. 
again, from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. All right. So first of all, um, the great prostitute that we saw back in chapter 18, eight, no, 17, um, great prostitute in chapter 17 has three names on it. And it doesn't mean that it's only Babylon the Great. It says Babylon the Great, but also has mother of prostitutes and the earth's abominations. Those are three names that are written on it. Remember that the great prostitute participates in Babylon the Great, um, the sins of Babylon and the influence and everything. But, um, but it's not only, it can be called Babylon the Great because it's worldly. It's very much a part of the world. And Babylon the Great is the city of the world more than anything. So they work definitely in conjunction with each other and even bear the name. But those, I mean, think about this. Those that bear the name of Christ um, aren't Christ, but they bear the name of Christ and they reflect him. It's the same thing here. So instead, though, of the great prostitute who reflects Babylon, this is the faithful bride of Christ, the holy city. So holy, pure, righteous. The new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, the wife of the lamb. And the lamb is Jesus, who was slaughtered for our sins, who took his, and that's why it's referred, he's referred to as the lamb, because his sacrifice freed us from the very things that others are now going into um, judgment for. So, either way, uh, again, the great prostitute is on one side, the faithful bride of Christ is on the other side of the spectrum. The prostitute uh, became worldly, and especially the worldly church, is, that's the great prostitute, the pole of that is strong, but these are those that stayed faithful. These are those that held to the to um, their faith in Christ, and many of them were killed or persecuted or oppressed or marginalized. They were not loved by the world, not welcome by the world. Yet they still, and they weren't mean people that are Christians. That's the prostitute, because they don't reflect the the fruit of God of Christ. They still, remember, Jesus calls us to love God and love one another. And so if we're, if we're saying, well, yeah, I'm holding to the testimonies and you can't tell me what to do because this is what God wants me to do, and we're jerks about it, we're not showing, we're, we're using self-centeredness, worldliness, mean, uh, and violence against, um, in God's name, which is deception. That's Satan. That's not Jesus. Anyways, Ezekiel uh, 40, verse 2, um, that is where you see that uh, Ezekiel, the prophet, gets this vision of God, and it brought him to this very high mountain to see the new temple of God. And this is what you're going to see here. We're going to see the gates and New Jerusalem are going to be measured, and it's very similar to Ezekiel seeing his vision and measuring um, the new temple and so forth. Um, and I do believe the new temple that actually that Ezekiel is talking about is is New Jerusalem ultimately is, is what it is. So in the new creation, God's presence will not be limited to a temple structure with people outside of it, but rather the people will be both the city and the temple. So the holy city is the temple of God, but the people live in it, not outside of it. In the temple in the Old Testament, we weren't allowed in there. The only ones that were allowed in there were the high priests. Um, anyways, Revelation 4 verse 3, it says that he on the throne, meaning God, had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Um, with this whole idea of being clear as crystal is going to be used later on in our passage here as well. But that's the radiance of God, this glow from God, this jasper is very important that we're going to see used here uh, throughout. And also um, this clear as crystal. But regardless, that the, the city itself not only is holy and pure, but God, it has God's glory coming out of it. Why? Because he's in it. He lives in there. So... Anyway, moving on to the next passage and the next slide. Verse 
5, or I'm sorry, verse 12, slide 5. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So, all right, this is, this is what's most important about this. There's a great high wall, and it ultimately is, is there's 12 um, gates that are there, and it highlights the 12 gates, have 12 angels at the 12 gates, and they have on them the names of the 12 tribes written. The 12 tribes of Jacob. It's the Old Testament. It links the covenant of God with Israel, the people of God. And at, in the Exodus, there are... Um, they have this military kind of um, around the, the tabernacle. There is this military-like encampment. So you have three tribes on each of the four sides around the tabernacle. And the gates are going to be structured in the same way. And it has the names of each of these tribes on there. So what does that signify? It's signifying the covenant of the Old Testament. Well, what's fascinating is that the wall also have, of the city has 12 foundations. So the 12 foundations are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So therefore, you've got also covenant in the New Testament. And what you saw is even earlier on in Revelation, we saw, I believe it's in chapter 4, that there are 24 elders that are around the throne of God. And that's what these 12, I believe, that you have the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament marking covenant. And then you have the new covenant, the apostles of Christ. And it was important for them to have all 12 of them there after Jesus died and was resurrected for them to go out in testimony as a 12. Why? Because it's covenant. It's supposed to tell us that the covenant of the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament and that covenant, that promise, all of that to Israel and Jacob that dwells with or deals with the Genesis 3 and sin and everything that happened there to be a blessing to the world is carrying through over into the New Testament with the 12 apostles. It continues that and it's a fulfillment of Genesis 3's promise for God to make things right and to deal with sin and the serpent and everything else there. So therefore, yeah, Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, around the throne is 24 thrones. So here's the other thing, the wall. There's some people I'm sure that, that are thinking to themselves, why is there a wall for Jerusalem? I mean, first of all, Jerusalem, if it's part of the new creation and all evil is gone, there's no sin that's there. So there's no enemies there. What the heck do you need a wall for then? Are you protecting from enemies? There aren't any enemies. And the point is, is that the wall isn't to protect against enemies. It's there to make sure that we understand how do you enter into the city? How do we get into the city of the new Jerusalem? The point is, is that the walls, everything outside of these walls go to the lake of fire. So, all that is outside of the walls go to the lake of fire. Everything inside the walls then is, are those that become citizens of the new Jerusalem. And what we see here is that they dwell with God. This is another just symbolic way of saying we're dwelling with God. It's those that come into the covenant of God. And this is saying it fulfills both Old Testament covenant and New Testament covenant. It's the people of God. Ultimately, the way you get in is through covenant with God. We have to surrender to Christ is what it comes down to. All right, so going to the next slide, verse slide, slide uh, 6, verse 15. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with its rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal, 
He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which also is also an angel's measurement. All right, so what's going on here? So measuring um, this, first of all, this vision further amplifies the last one. It's deeper details um, about New Jerusalem. And, and ultimately, so what else this is basically saying here? Um, when something is measured, it is absolutely certain to happen. The details are there. It is, it is this is what the measurements are, um, even the new uh, uh, temple in Ezekiel. It is certain to happen. However, what's fascinating is, is that it is, though, uh, it is put into effect through Christ symbolically. So even though it's measurements and it's certain to happen, doesn't mean that it physically is exactly what it's saying here, literally. It's showing that the things that are happening are much bigger, much greater, and it is open to the nations in Ezekiel passage side of things. But... Um, Anyone, the one who spoke with me, the measuring rod of gold, it means it's a divine measuring, uh, measure the city and its gates and its walls. So in uh, Revelation 11 verse 1, we see that uh, it says, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. And there's a trampling that happens on the outside of the temple, ultimately saying that no one can end up taking the salvation that God has given to us. So on the inside of the temple, it's safe, meaning inside of us. Um, nobody can take that from us, the salvation that God gives us through Christ. However, on the outside, we're going to suffer persecution. And there might be physical death or beatings or imprisonment or oppression or whatever the case is. But regardless, um, Zechariah 2 actually talks about how Jerusalem will have no walls. That God's presence is a fire that basically is a protection. So it's it's not the New Jerusalem is not something that that the walls actually protect against evil. There's no need for it. Um, it's more of how we get in. So Ezekiel forty through forty eight is the whole New Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, New Temple um, measurements and and details and everything that's mapped out. Very similar thing is happening here. Our text: what's being measured is the city, the gates. And the walls, and the walls entail, basically, the gates are part of the walls. So, anyway, the city, its length and its width and height are all equal. That is so important for us to understand because there's only one thing in the temple of God that that happens with. Um, the rest of the temple is more of a rectangle kind of a thing. Um, a perfect square, the only part of the entire temple or tabernacle was the most holy place, the holy of holies, where God's, the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, where God's presence itself actually was, the most holy place. And what that is ultimately telling us is that the entire city of Jerusalem is the most holy place, the holy of holies, where God himself dwells. And what that's showing is that he dwells with his people. We're going to see that those people will see him face to face, like never before. Um, amazing. But either way, it says lies four square, the length of uh, the same as its width. Um, even this, this 12,000 stadia and its length, its width, its height. So the 12,000 stadia, if you end up literally interpreting this that way, what that would come to be would be, um, it would be this 14... Uh, 100 miles uh, square, which I've given you a um, a visual here that would show in the United States how big this city would be. So it's a pretty big city. I mean, if you literally want to interpret that, I think it would be more than sufficient. Um, and that's in every way. That's not only up, um, or I should say it's not only, you know, north, south, east, west, but it's also up also. Uh, it's a cube. I don't think that that's what's happening here, though. What I do think is, is that this is ultimately telling us this. Remember, in um, Revelation 7, in Revelation chapter 7, you see that the those that have the mark of God, that they are um, 
there's 12,000 from each of the tribes of Jacob, which equal the 144,000. And those represent all of God's people. And it starts off with the tribes of Jacob. However, you see right after that initial section in chapter 7, then right after that you see that it includes all the nations of the world. So it's not just limited to only uh, Jews or Israelites. It is including everyone from all nations. It's ultimately those that believe in Christ, that have faith in Christ, that come into the new covenant. And the new covenant is an extension of the old covenant. So therefore, what this is showing here, this 12,000 stadia, I believe, is a symbolic way of, again, saying those who are who bear the mark of God, those that are the ones that dwell in the city of God. And this 144 cubits is indicating the 144,000 total people. It's a human measurement, also an angel's measurement. I believe that this is also saying as far as angelic and humans all living together as one in God's presence, all of that. Powerful. Spiritual unification of all. All right, so keep moving here. The next slide, verse uh, 18 And slide seven, the wall was built of jasper. Remember that God's presence is, his glory is jasper. While the city was pure gold, gold is divinity, like clear glass. Remember the transparency and crystal clear and so forth. All of those, again, God's glory in verse 11 of our, of this chapter itself. So it's showing divinity, God, his presence, And then continuing, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first, now here's what's so fascinating about this. Again, there's 12. There were 12 jewels or gems that were on the breastplate of the Levitical priest, especially the high priest. Um, And he had them in uh, rows, there were four rows of three that went across. And either way, this one here is a little bit different. Um, and I'm going to highlight the similarities of it in just a second. Um, but our text says the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper. Second was sapphire. Third, a gate. Um, fourth, emerald. Fifth, onyx. Sixth, carnelian. Seven, chrysolite. Eighth, beryl. Ninth, topaz. Tenth, chrysop. Pras, um, 11th, Jacinth, and 12th, Amethyst. So, in Exodus 28, we see that these jewels that are marked on the Levitical high priest, these are listed in this order. In fact, you know what? I'm not going to actually go through all of them because it's just naming off these in different orders. I just want to highlight, if you go to see what this text says, here's what you'll notice. The thing that's fascinating is that the last em- or the last jewel on the list, and each of these jewels represented the 12 tribes of Israel on the uh, high priest's chest. Jasper, which is the last one on there in the Exodus it, for the Levitical priest, becomes the first in the new Jerusalem. Jasper is the first which the wall is adorned with. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what Jesus tells us, that the last will be first? The last on earth will be the first in the kingdom of heaven? That's exactly what's here. The last, and it's, but it's God's people. It's not everybody in the world. The last will be the first in heaven. And you see that here just with the jasper. The only consistent one out of all of them is the fourth one, which is emerald. In the Levitical priest's uh, breastplate, fourth one was emerald, and also it is here as well. I think that's fascinating because we see in Revelation chapter 4 verse 3 that the rainbow over God's head is emerald. And so I do believe that all of this is highlighting this, this importance of covenant. Covenant is essential. The only way that we're getting God's grace, his love, his mercy, his salvation is through covenant. That's it. It's the only way. When people say, you know, I know so many people that are good, that are more nice than, than Christians sometimes. People that are non-Christians are nicer than 
Christians. How could, is God so cruel that he's going to send a person to, to hell that is a nice person but doesn't believe in Jesus? How fair is that? Especially when he lets one of their evil Christians go into heaven. It doesn't work that way. First of all, an evil Christian, just because they say they're Christian, doesn't mean they're getting into heaven. It's a deception. It's a lie. They might say that they are. They might proclaim that they are. But our fruit is what ultimately exposes what's within. And if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within and we are submissive to it, then we will overflow with the fruits, the fruit of Christ. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, all of the things that are of, of Jesus. Um, so the other thing is, is that here's the deal. You can be a nice human, the problem is, is that sin has still not been dealt with. And the only thing, the only religion that deals with sin against God is Jesus. That's it. That's why he's the only way. Because he's the only one that deals with the issue of sin. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that did. And so therefore there is no other way. When Jesus begs at Gethsemane, right before he goes to the cross, he begs his father. He said, if there's any other way for me to not go through this with this, you know, don't make me drink this cup if I don't need to. If there's any other way, please don't make me do this. And he says, but your will be done. And the father makes him go through it because there's no other way. That's it. Um, covenant. Covenant is the only way coming in, surrender to Christ that accepts the provision that God gives to us and gives us that forgiveness of sins and coming into heaven, into New Jerusalem is, is what it's seen here. I use this as an example also. This is important for people to understand, I think, more than anything. It's not so much that, oh, you know, if you won't accept Christ, then I'm just going to throw you into hell. It's more of this. If you have someone that's drowning and say that you go out to try and rescue them and they're flopping around and stuff and you say to them, look, you have to surrender to me. You have to go limp and not fight me because if you do, I can't help you and you might kill us both. Or maybe a better explanation or a, sim uh, a sample or a, an image to, to show you of what's happening with God is if we're lost, say, in a jungle or something like that. And someone comes to rescue us and they say, they find us and they say, look, I know the way out of here, but you got to follow me. And we say, no, I'm, I'll find my own way. I can't help you. I can't help you if you don't listen. And that is exactly what covenant, that's what God is doing. I, I have provided, I've paid everything, but you got to follow me and I'll show you the way out of here. No. Okay, then it doesn't work for you. Then you got, you're going to do it on your own. Good luck with that. That's what all of this is confirming. If, if we ever didn't understand it before, there's so much that's affirming. This is what allows you in. There's no mistaking it. God is pouring it on so heavy, so thick, he's dumping it out in buckets. All right, so even the lament over uh, the king of Tyre, what is fascinating in the book of Ezekiel, this is just a side thing that we can talk about in the Bible study, but Ezekiel 28 verse 12, it, it goes through and Tyre is a city that is is really equivalent. It's kind of compared to Satan. And that is a fascinating thing. And he also, it says, is every precious stone was his covering. Um, uh, incredible in beauty. But ultimately, his arrogance and pride got the best of him. What's fascinating is that, um, number one, it only has nine jewels as opposed to 12. And number two is that Sardis and Topaz, which are the first two also of the stones that are on the Levitical priest's chest. Interesting. What the implications are of that, we'll save for the Bible study. But anyways, the walls and the wall and its details are the completed people of God who dwell in security and beauty with God's presence in them and among them. All right. So next slide, second to last slide here today. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So there it is again, clear and gold, 
Again, the glory of God is what that's showing. Again, 12 gates were 12 pearls. So pearls is just, is simply, um, I believe, a, a thing of luxury, of beauty, of richness also. It is a um, great value is what you see actually in, in um, Job 28, 18, Matthew 7, 6, and chapter 13, 45 in Matthew as well, Revelation 17 through 18, all of them talking about pearls as being a great value, and that is what ultimately the gates were made of as a single pearl. Um, valuable. It's extremely valuable. And, and honestly, I would say even going back to the parable of the pearl, what, what Matthew is talking about especially is Jesus is saying that, that uh, in searching for this, this great treasure that, that a person finds this pearl and sells everything that they have. And that's, that's it, that you've made God number one, that God is a great value to you. Um, he is, he's God. There is no other God. So it shows not bringing idolatry in. Um, those are the ones that enter. And it says, uh, then in verse 22, and I saw no temple in the city for the temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. So we've already covered this, the temple of God, the tabernacle, the temple, whatever you want to call it. The bottom line is there is no temple there. Why? Because even though it's Jerusalem, because that's where the temple was. The reason why there's no temple there is because there's no need for it anymore. God dwells among his people, in his people. It's not needed. And then in verse 23, And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the Lamb. Okay. So, I I guarantee you that I'm still going to have people, even though throughout for 21 chapters so far, I've been saying, it's, this is not literal. Okay. Um, Could there be no sun in the new Jerusalem? Yeah, it's possible, okay? But that's not the point here. The point, more than anything, is showing that, and I don't know what new creation, what new Jerusalem is going to look like um, specifically, because I haven't been there. All it's showing, though, is the details is what it's going to be like. And the point here is that they're... Remember at the beginning of Genesis, in creation, it says that the, that the luminaries in the heavens, the stars and the sun and the moon, were meant for signs and symbols. They were meant to tell uh, of time, but also um, they're for signs and symbols. It's not for witchcraft and astrology. What it is, is it is something that's supposed to help us to understand this whole concept of light and darkness. Remember the very first day, what does God do? He spoke and he says, let there be light. There's still no moon though. Where's the moon or the sun? The sun and the moon are not there yet. And yet he says, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God doesn't need the sun He doesn't need the moon. He doesn't need the stars. He can create his own light. And the point is is that his own presence is the beaming light. It is what is life. The light is good. Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. And in him was the life of men. The darkness has not overcome it. All of these images are coming back into here, what it's referring to. The point is simply speaking, but it's using all these images that have been already used throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. God is there. Not like it is here in this world where we don't see Him. We see Him. He is there. We visually see Him, experience Him. He's around us. He's in us. He's through us. There's no separation. There's no evil. There's no death. There's no sickness. There's no anything bad. It is all good. Gosh, that's awesome. Last slide. twenty-four, Verse 24. By its light, the light of the Lamb... The nations will walk. This word for nations also means people. And I believe the reason why it says nations, it's not because there's going to be nations outside of even Jerusalem, because there really isn't anything outside of Jerusalem is ultimately going to be uh, the lake of fire, is ultimately is judgment. So therefore, this whole thing of, of nations will be people from all of the nations. By the light of Christ they walk, meaning that their life is all in submission and surrender to him. Anyone that's in New Jerusalem is going to be in surrender and submission to Christ as king. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. 
I would say this is the new earth is what it's talking about, first of all. But whether it be those that, um, that are in places of authority, there will be a hierarchy in heaven, depending on what we did on this earth also. Uh, even as believers, will determine uh, what we are given in heaven as well. Jesus says those that have been given much, um, much is expected. And also at the same point, they'll be rewarded as such when they get into heaven as well, because they show that they're worthy of, of more. So, therefore... Even those, those that are in authority figures, even in New Jerusalem, they will bring their glory into it. And why? Why is that important? Because their glory is God's glory. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. The gates are never going to be shut. Why? They're going to be there, but they're they're not going to be shut. Why does that mean there's no enemies? There really isn't a need for the gates. The gates, again, are just symbolizing how we do to get in. There'll be no night there. There's no darkness. It's only light. Does that mean we never sleep? Again, it's not literal necessarily. Might we never sleep? Maybe. Maybe, but that's not the point here. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. Again, it's, it's leading back to that part, that last part of verse 24 there. They bring all of this in and it is welcome because it is in the image and the likeness of God. They are surrendered to God just like the four beasts that surround the throne. They are submissive to God the way it's supposed to be. God is still God. And here it is, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nothing will ever enter it that is unclean, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. So deceptive, deception, lies, detestable things that are not of God that he hates, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's who dwells there. And ultimately, that is the message that of this chapter. The only ones that are getting in through these gates are those that have put God as number one. Those that have kept him apart from idols. There are no idols in their life. They are loyal to the Lamb. He is their light. He is their life. He is their hope. Everything that they do, God's spirit and his, his presence dwells in them, through them. And um, everything in this city glorifies God. There's no separation. There's no evil. There's no deception, lying, suffering. This is an encouragement to us, or it should be. The justice and life without evil, it is coming. It's coming. It's an encouragement of Christ saying, hang in there. Don't give up what was given to you. Those letters of the seven churches are different ways that deception can come in. Two of them, small, two out of seven churches are actually commended for doing a good job. But five, most of them are not. That is so much where we are today. And Jesus is saying, repent, change, or I will come against you. It's a warning. And this is what it's all coming to, that either we are on, we are embracing Christ and we're holding on to him. And the point is, is this, the only way that we're going to pass all of these tests and the refining and stuff is surrender to the spirit of God. If we don't surrender to the spirit of God, we don't surrender to Christ. And if we're not doing that, we're still king. And we're still on the throne when we create idols and we don't listen to God. And what we find is our church has got Jesus standing outside like Laodicea. I stand at the door and knock. Why is he outside? He's not even welcome in his own church. Isn't that exactly what happened with Jesus in the the New Testament, the Old and New Testament right at that place? When he became human, he wasn't welcomed in his own temple. In fact, they crucified him. They killed him. Jesus is saying, I know the same thing's going to happen to those that are mine. Because they're not of this world. But they are supposed to be light in this world. And all that is mine, that is light, are going to be brought into New Jerusalem. Where there's nothing but light. There's no darkness. There's no sea. There's no evil. There's no sin, no suffering, no death. It's all good. All good. This is something amazing for us to look forward to. But it's also essential for us to know how to enter it. Because if we don't know how to enter it, this is only a thing of a story. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, that's what God is telling us. I'll give you grace. Just surrender 
to my son, he's going to take the price. He's going to pay the price and he knows the way out. But you got to follow him. If you're not willing to follow him out, I can't help you. Because sin has to be dealt with. And I've done everything. I've taken everything upon myself. But you need to follow me out. And if you're not willing to follow me out, then you basically are telling me to leave you alone. And one day, God will give us exactly what we want. Our lives will show us, show him, and will be a testimony either for or against us, whether we wanted to embrace God's presence or not. God ultimately gives us what we want. Why would we want to live in New Jerusalem if we were telling him on this earth, always, God, leave me alone? Because New Jerusalem is all about him being everywhere. He's in everything. He's everywhere. It's all about him. That would be hell to anyone who doesn't want to have anything to do with God. So he's not going to give that to him. Those who say, leave me alone, get that eternally. Those who say, I love, I surrender to God, I serve God, and are filled with his spirit, which is what we're always meant for, then he gives it to them eternally. It's a reward for holding in, for being a part of what Jesus started. He started a ministry to bring all of God's people in, ultimately to a place of no sin, but he doesn't want one of his children left behind. We get to be a part of that, and this is a celebration. Next week, we're going to talk about what this water of life all is all about and what that basically is doing, and that's the final chapter of the book. So let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this message. We thank you for your commitment, your covenant promise, which is completely, totally true and reliable. We thank you, and we praise you, and I pray that this sermon, this service would speak into people's hearts, open up their eyes, their ears, and their hearts to you, and that they would come into your presence, surrender to Christ, and come into eternal life for your glory. And pray this all in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.